do its thing. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Well, good evening, everyone. First of all, before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, the Pottstown Historical Society and uh, all its uh, uh, members and uh, leadership for allowing me to do this presentation. Um, I was, it seems like I was just here a short time ago talking about the Firebirds. And, of course, this evening we have a slightly different topic uh, of the uh, Mighty Adam and Slim the Hammer Man. I also want to thank Elliot uh, Mankiewicz, who uh, introduced me to Slim, who's here this evening, Larry Farman. Um, and uh, Slim, thank you very much for allowing me to come to your dungeon and teaching me all about you and the, the story of my Maria. pleasure. It was. Uh, I didn't call it the dungeon. My wife did. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why. First of all, I'd like to ask: How many people here actually remember? Those of us of a certain age actually remember uh, the Mighty Adam. Oh my! <laughs> I, wow. I, I assume most most of us would remember him from Zerns, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now I remember. So, you remember him from Zerns too? Or? No. He used to come to the Bombstown auction outside of Bird's Yeah. He, well, well, we'll get a little. We're getting a little bit ahead of where he used to go here in the, in Pennsylvania. But this story is his story, and his story, and his mentorship and friendship with uh, with Larry Farman, who then, as we all know, is Slim the Hammer Man. I say here the world's strongest men. Of course, there'll probably be arguments back and forth on that issue, but we could say the world's strongest old time <laughs> men. Okay, because they these were old time performers and uh, old time strong men, and they did things that. Younger people or people today would never even think about doing, and we'll 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 talk about that. But first, Joseph Greenstein, the mighty Adam. Joseph Greenstein, his his story is stranger than fiction. He was born in a shtetl, a, a, a village in northeastern Poland, around 1892. Very poor family. His father died of tuberculosis when he was very young. He himself was very sickly, very, um, uh, very much uh, in the in the in the time frame that he was living, where many people contracted TB, died of what it was called consumption. The doctor in the village said, you know, you're gonna, you know, told his mother he would be dead by about 18, and there was no reason for him to doubt that. A traveling circus came to town. He went to see the circus, met a man named Bolanco, the champion Bolanco, who was a strong man. Bolanco befriended him, said, why don't you come with us on, on, uh, when we go uh, on our tour? He basically ran away with the circus. Didn't tell his mother. Left. Was gone for eight months. The circus went from Poland all the way down to India for the winter. He over this time, uh, under the leadership and mentorship of the great uh, champion Volanco, learned how to uh, build up his body using uh, you know, weights. He would gradually ha have two buckets and add salt, uh, sand to the buckets to gradually in increase the weight. Got to India, uh, in Pune, India, where they met with uh, uh, a number of uh, 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 I would imagine we would call them maybe yogis or mat, but but uh, would learn uh, traditions of of, of uh, Eastern uh, uh, mind control. Uh, all the time, he was basically becoming more skilled at at, at his um, in his strength building. Came back to Poland, pro probably gave his mother a heart attack when he walked in the door, <laughs> and at that point, his history then comes eventually to the United States. He marries his uh, childhood girlfriend, Leah. She was all of 14 years old. He might have been a year or two older than that when they got married. He comes to the United States early in the 20th century, lands in Galveston, Texas, uh, where he starts off with a gasoline station, has a small gasoline station. Um, he worked uh, as a rustabout on, on oil rigs uh, in, in Texas, but over this period of time, he also was in, a, in the process of building up his body and controlling his mind. Let me move 
forward here. If we can uh, play that clip. This is a clip, a trailer from a movie that was uh, produced in 2017. It's available on, uh, uh, online. Um, it's an introduction to the, to the Mighty Adam. Your audiovisual person will be with you right. in just a minute. We'll get to this in a second. <laughs> While we wait for the video to come up, <laughs> let me just say that he was not known as the Mighty Adam at this time. He was still Joe, Joe Greenstein. Had a, had a wife, eventually nine children, which have not, was not atypical, of course, at the time. Met... Uh, by accident, um, almost serendipitously met the great Houdini. Uh, the, um, the Houdini was traveling with his tour. Ready? Yep, ready. And stopped at his gas station. And at, in that stop, he actually, they had to change What's the What's the greatest feat of strength you've ever seen? No. No. It's not up. How about a five foot four inch man who stopped the he, plane from taking he, uh, off with his hair? He had to change their tire. He lifted the, the, the car with one hand <laughs> with Houdini and his tour inside the car. No. <laughs> no. And he used his other hand to pull the tire off the rim with no tools. <laughs> that, got their attention. <laughs> the manager for Houdini saw an act when he, you know, knew an act when he saw one, and basically signed him up and said, we need to take you around, develop some routines, you know, what, like things you can do, um, and he showed him some of the tricks that he had developed, including bending bars, uh, biting chains, with his teeth, and and some other things that he was that he was working on. Again, not as a strong man, but simply, you know, in, in his interest as as, as as something that he wanted to do. The manager convinced them to go to New York City, and start you know kind of that's where you start off in in, in performing. In the 1920s, what do you do in, in a place like New York? You do vaudeville, and vaudeville had a long tradition of performers of strong men <coughs> who would be in on stage doing their tricks, doing their, I shouldn't say tricks, doing their, their skills on stage. And he became known around New York on the vaudeville circuit, would go to cities upstate New York, would go Pennsylvania, travel around, started traveling around the country, constantly looking, kind of thinking of ideas that he could come up with to perform on, on the vaudeville circuit. I'm going to suggest we do the video at the end when I can turn the computer around. I'm not having any luck right now. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we'll, do the, we'll do the trailer at the end then. Here are some pictures. As you can see, bending bars. If you can appreciate this. Uh, this was not very common among strong men to bend bars. He was certainly one of one of the one of the unique individuals. Joe Greenstein um, is only five foot five foot four, all of about 145 pounds, and yet here he is performing acts that men twice his size wouldn't be able to do. Example of breaking a chain, where he would have a chain around his chest, expand his chest, and break the chain with his chest. It's not facing. Okay, you can move it for me. Yeah. There we go. Some of the acts that he perfected during his uh, during his illustrious career. You would lie down on a bed of nails. I had that nail bed in and my head. And you had that nail bed. <laughs> <laughs> and 
he would lie down, they would place an anvil on his chest, <gasps> which bad, was bad enough, and then they would pound the anvil <laughs> with a sledgehammer. So this is after <laughs> the pounding. And you'll see this in the trailer when we get the trailer work. He would bend bars, not only with his hands, but he could bend bars on his nose, okay? So here you have two, two uh, assistants pulling back on the bars, and he's bending the bar with his no with his right here on his nose. Um, his hair. He he worked to strengthen his hair, strengthen the hair follicles on his head, and he has he obviously had a lot of hair. In order to perform acts with his hair, and. I wouldn't advise anybody you know, in this room to do it, but what he would do is use his hair to lift and to pull, and he could break, he, he would have a special comb, and he would have a chain, and he would break or bend a bar using his hair for torque. Okay. And amazing, of course this is all in the 1920s and 30s, Vaudeville, uh, before you had, uh, obviously, before you had television, mostly, again, mostly the East Coast. He would come here to Pennsylvania and perform on circuits like some of the county fairs, Allentown Fair, York County Fair, come here, discovered Zerns, was here all the time at Zerns, uh, Friday and Saturday evenings. Click on working now. Okay. Here he is, you know, supporting oh, a car. Oh <laughs> and they didn't make cars out of plastic back then. <laughs> you may remember, um, if anybody remembers him from Zerns, he had the, the truck and a lot of pictures on the back of his truck performing, showing some of, the, some of his acts. One of the interesting things, though, about, about, about the Mighty Adam is that, especially later in his career, he wasn't going around necessarily to perform. He was trying to sell health products. He came up with his own uh, formulas for things like soaps, uh, liniments, uh, laxatives. He was into health and health foods and health uh, cosmetics long before anybody else. In fact, probably you could, you could call uh, the Mighty Adam, probably one of the first of the health conscious generation, years or decades ahead of his time. And the products he made, which were natural products, he, made, he had made, again with his formula, but those products, were they worked. He was not selling snake oil, which would have been pretty <coughs> popular, you know, a lot of medicine men going around selling snake oil. He was actually selling products that work. And one of the products, actually, I think was the, the laxative, was made here in Red Hill. So these were products that, you know, locally made but to, his, to his specs. And you do remember him at Zerns. Here's the back of the, the truck. He performed well into his 70s and actually into his 80s. And he performed up until, not the day he died, but within a half an hour of his death in the hospital. Even when he was in the hospital at, at, at the end of his life, his sons would bring in penny nails, long nails, and he would go around the ward talking to the other patients and showing them you know, that he could still bend this, the, 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 the long nails. Okay to give them hope that they could recover. So, incredible man. Now, question that always rises is how was he able to do these things? And for us, of course, in this room, we can't ask him, we can only surmise. But from speaking with, with Slim, it appears that not only did he strengthen his body, but he, he, he strengthened his mind to an extent that very few of us could even comprehend. Whether it's called a regulator or a governor or whatever it is in our heads that tells us we can't do something, 
he was able to either eliminate it or push it aside. And so there was nothing that he had in his, in, in his mind that said, you couldn't do this. So anything that, anything that he put his mind to, he was successful in doing. Except for one thing, business. <laughs> he was a lousy businessman. <laughs> and he failed multiple times in, the, in, in whatever businesses he went in, into from the time he was in Galveston, Texas until he went to New York. He lived in Brooklyn, by the way. Huh. It, he never was a success in business. He was an incredible success in everything else. He raised a wonderful family. And as Slim and others point out, what really makes him incredible is that he is not shaped or built like your prototypical strongman. You think of somebody who, who a, a man of strength, you're thinking of somebody who's big with muscles, muscle, a lot of muscle mass. He's five foot four, and he comes from a culture in which you really don't have a lot of famous Jewish strongmen. <laughs> and yet, he was probably the best of them. <coughs> Now this brings us, since we're in Zerns, this brings us to the second half of the story, and this is the portion of the story that includes uh, Larry Farman. So we have Larry here tonight. Larry is known as Slim the Hammerman. So you have Joe Greenstein, the Mighty Adam, and by the way, the reason he called they, he was called the Mighty Adam was because of he, his height as, as being so short, Adam being small. He became, he, his name, his stage name was the Mighty Adams. For, for Larry, I think it's pretty obvious what his stage name, where it came from, and that is from his own special talents in lifting sledgehammers. Now, I also have a YouTube clip of uh, Slim. I guess we'll wait again. Can we wait? We'll yeah. wait till after. Okay. But in that clip, it would show Slim <coughs> lifting two sledgehammers and picking them up and lifting them up and then putting them down again. Now, people may think, wow, well, what's so difficult about that? Well, let me just go on. I'll go to this first. Lifting anything... You know, if, if, if you or I were to lift a, a sledgehammer, we would most likely lift it from where? The middle or near the head of the hammer. Okay? But the, the challenge here is if you have a weight on the end of a hammer, in this case, say, 25 pounds, and you have a 30-inch handle, and you're picking it up at the very end of the handle, this no longer is just 25 pounds. It's 25 pounds times the length of the handle, which in this case is 30 inches. <coughs> which, if your math is correct, it comes out to 750 pound, inch pounds. And I'm not, a, I, I don't remember having this class in physics class, but 750 pounds is pretty heavy. In fact, <laughs> as is pointed out here, and this is what Slim said in this, in this um, clip, he says, a person who can clean and jerk 400 pounds, pretty impressive, likely could not raise a 12-pound hammer using this technique. So this is a very, very special, <coughs> unique talent. Now, I'm going to go back and um, Larry, I, I, I think you recognize yourself in that uh, picture. But what makes this story really special to us is that Larry is a local boy. His mother is from Limerick, his mother Rose from Limerick. Uh, Larry himself uh, went to school in Norristown, told stories of how as a, young, as, a, as a young teenager would go around trying to come up with ways to make a nickel or a dime or a quarter. And I won't go into some of those stories. I don't, some of them are probably a little bit off color. <laughs> but he looked for ways to help his family 
and try to come up with, you know, it, it, this would have been, you know, after the war, late 40s, okay, mid to late 40s, went to Norristown High School, and then while in high school, a, um, a life-changing event took place in, in, in the, um, uh, in, in a class uh, with the, in the auditorium where uh, it was announced that Larry Farman was voted least likely to succeed in life. <laughs> now, you can't get away with that today. I think some lawyers would be involved in that. But in the 1950s, I guess, times were different. And as Larry described it, he got up offered the middle finger from both hands to the audience <laughs> and he walked out, basically left high school and he said to himself, I am going to be the best, the absolute best at something. Now I don't think in, at that time you knew what you were going to be doing. Soon after, <clears throat> Larry went to work in this place. Anybody recognize that? Gil, Gil Quarry. It's that quarry near Norristown. And Larry spent his entire, pretty much his entire working life working in the quarry. I dug that hole. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't do it by himself. <laughs> but he was in the quarry cracking rock with a sledgehammer, starting from a very young age and through his entire adult life. He also, of course, married his wonderful wife Shirley, they raised a family, daughter Penny is in the room. But during this period of time, he was building up his body. And it, by the way, when you're six foot six plus, you probably are already starting out ahead of the game with bodybuilding. Now, what Larry told me was that he would take his girl, eventually his wife, on date night. Now, date night, if many of you remember, date night around here was a trip to Zerns. I never took a date to Zerns, I confess. But I have taken, when I, when I was much older, I actually took uh, my, my, uh, my first wife-to-be, took her. Um, I, took, I do remember taking a girlfriend once there. I did take my, my second wife to Zerns, introduced them to Zerns. So there is some logic to this whole date night thing. But when Larry went on date night, he would go to watch a performer named the Mighty Adam. And the Mighty Adam, if you remember, he would be out there performing with his bars and everything. And he said one time, when Larry was in the audience, something to the effect like, here I am, an old man of whatever he was. And he always added 10 years to his age because he, it sounded more impressive. So if it was 60, he said, I'm all, here I am, an old man of 70. You know, most of us try to reduce our age. He was always trying to add on to it. You know, I can, you know, can anyone in this, in, 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 in anyone else here be able to bend the bar? And uh, Larry had seen him perform many, many times, but being a cocky, sassy, you know, young man, he said, well, can you, old man? And of course, 